one article in a major uh, magazine that was published, uh, I think it was end of October. And we have one other piece working plus a project of a book that uh, we'll hope to uh, work throughout 2021. The idea around the new, uh, uh, the post-pandemic orders is that any kind of shock is going to create a number of different phenomena that we need to understand. Shocks come, they are mostly unexpected. They are not necessarily unknown. Um, infectious diseases is not a mystery. We've been having problems with viruses for most of history. Uh, we had Ebola in 2014. We were lucky that it was not airborne. Therefore, it wasn't transferring through uh, you know, the air. Um, but it was likely to imagine that one day we would have a virus, like we had SARS, MERS, and other kind of viruses that were transferred through air. Now, of course, the shock came at the pace and with the magnitude we've never seen before. And that has created an entirely different landscape on the forces that were dominating now uh, a higher degree of uncertainty because we suddenly lost the compass and a higher degree of impact because we had a simultaneous problem with a real economy freeze and a financial economy as a consequence. This shock created an entirely new logic. So suddenly people started to think about reality in a very different way. New logics, a new way of thinking, new way of assessing risk. So forces usually shape an entirely different thinking that is emerging from this. And that was really where we started to notice that 2020 was creating a very different outlook than what we have seen in the past. This was not the first time that we had shocks but it was the first time that the shock was so widely spread around the world that no matter who you were, the level of mobility we have in the world was creating uh, the, the risk that was somehow being uh, carried with uh, the mobility of uh, transport people. But we really were looking at the fact that this is a deeper crisis because no only has created the freeze but it's also changing a lot of our most normal behavior about things like working, using transportation, traveling. And this led to the phenomenon. More and more new business models were emerging. New form of behavior were emerging. People were starting to shift to e-commerce and online. Uh, restaurants had to figure out a way to make everything to go. Uh, healthcare was becoming a priority. Uh, technology was becoming quite important because whoever was being impacted by the freeze of the real economy was thinking whether they could resort to technology to continue to produce. If you were mainly working in uh, the government or in public health, you wondered whether you could trace people and understand whether you could determine how to contact a patient that were mainly infected. So suddenly the new behavior was given space for two of the major drivers of the fourth industrial revolution. One is the automation in which now more and more companies were trying to automate their processes. The other one was the acceptance that real time information and real, the real time data was creating a space for machine learning and artificial intelligence structures to basically be pushed forward. So suddenly the forces, the logic and the phenomenon were creating an entirely different set of an organizing principle in which what we were somehow incubating for quite some time was propelled almost like an eco chamber at a much faster pace. We could say that the COVID-19 has been one of the most significant accelerant in history in which some activities that were already incubated before have simply accelerated in average about seven years. I was having a call um, actually in uh, Turkey with uh, the largest uh, entity for investment and uh, it was uh, organized in a panel. So there was uh, uh, a gentleman from McKinsey who has done significant research on their portfolio clients on how much were their clients accelerated through COVID. And he said that the average was around seven years. And this acceleration happened primarily in two ways. As I mentioned before, the transformation of the value chain into digital that can happen by creating more and more solutions through softwares and the transformation of the production system through robotics. So software and hardware, regardless of what you do, got accelerated by a larger acceptance that the pandemic was accelerating the need we have 
for technology to support us when we need it the most. That's when we go into the second part of the conversation, the ability for organizations and governments to diagnose the impact of the forces, the logic and the phenomenon and understand how their entire system had been transformed, created two opportunity. Those entities that were surrendering to the reality and that's why many businesses could not survive, mismanage the cash flow and eventually disappear or getting acquired. And those organizations that were becoming extremely agile and capable of changing their way of creating value so that they could adaptively create a new value proposition that was trying to go in the direction of where the market has gone. Markets do not disappear. They simply change their behavior. And so many organizations that were capable of assessing the impact of forces, logic, and phenomenon were able to rapidly adapt. This is why COVID-19 has two different sides. As I mentioned before, a winner side, where we see more and more people on the winner side, primarily if you had investing in technology or if you were removing your dependency from the physical world and the loser side, those organizations that had not digitized enough or that were too far away from the idea of digitizing, that were too heavily related to the physical world and did not have any form of agility or dexterity to actually bounce back and move in a direction of, uh, of resilience. And finally, and somehow most importantly, because that's why the framework was designed, triage. How do we start thinking of experimenting in a way that we can start having shorter cycle experimentation by trying to understand how the market has shifted because markets are much more complex and collectively smarter than any entity per se. So the ability for us to learn from the market and reintegrate the learning into our production is a critical new uh, normal that we should see in organization in the 21st century. So Flip It is a mechanism to get organization to think about shocks, not as problems, but as mechanism of transformation. They're mainly creating a, a catalytic approach to changing rapidly towards what is basically going to be a different value proposition that is designed to address the new demand by providing new capacity. Here's why I think the conversation I want to hear, I want to like share with you tonight is more about what will happen in the future once all of this conversation of COVID will hopefully be behind us. Well, COVID is just the very beginning of a number of shocks that will come our way as we are increasing our interdependency, system express both systemic opportunities as well as systemic risk. Therefore, thinking that COVID is a single event, it will actually is quite naive. COVID is the very first of a series of events that will continue to have a significant impact in the world. The challenge is not how do we respond to COVID? We're quite advanced now. The challenge is how do I prepare institutions and organization to deal with the next shock, something we don't know yet about? How do we make sure that we're creating a culture on innovation that is becoming the way organizations think about rapid adaptation? Because if before, one of the major mantra in organization was being prepared and doing corporate planning, Today, preparedness is not as important as it was before. Responsiveness is much more important because you prepare to something you know, but you respond to something that is unknown. So there's a clear understanding of the genetic of thinking that should really emerge in the new organizations of the 21st century. Now, the post-pandemic designs will most likely see also uh, a large form of differentiation between regions. There will be regions that will have dominated globally because they have believed in science and they have believed in the technocracy of governments in which government were much more important in operating as technocrats rather than as political ideologies. There's a side of the world, which is primarily the Western world, which is currently going through a strong identity crisis about, first of all, the United States became very insular stepping out from a role that they have for decades. The European Union is going through a number of different internal uh, fragmentations, not necessarily by becoming weaker, but definitely by becoming less consonant 
and with more dissent, the Brexit conversation has been a conversation that's profoundly changed the nature of the EU in many ways, because we have created the precedent that exiting is a possibility. At the same time, a number of extended period of inequalities in which large part of the middle class started to shrink in the EU like elsewhere as radicalized public opinion. And when you radicalize public opinion, you give space to political movement that tend to um, utilize the radical, the radical opinion to create ideologies. And around the world, we have seen, especially in the Western heritage, number of grassroots movement that tend to be more radical because they are actually stemming from a true discontent and what we consider social unrest. So while Europe and the United States were struggling with, I think, what they call the fight for their own soul in many ways, redefining what is the role of the West in an increasingly Eastern world, um, we have seen country rapidly rising to becoming hard powers. Clearly, China is a country that we should consider as having managed this conversation in 2020 in a very different way than what we expected China to do. A country like South Korea, uh, regions like Taiwan, Australia, New Zealand, uh, Asia in general is technocratically much more advanced in having determined the way in which the crisis is managed. Uh, we also see um, different shapes of crisis in which we do imagine that around us, uh, some scenario might possibly happen. So I'm gonna take you and skip in a couple of slides to the future logic where maybe we can think about uh, resonating together as we're having this conversation tonight. One possibility is a medieval mess, which is really what we call a W-shaped crisis, perpetual toggling or restraint and relief. So ongoing hammer and dance, the hammer is the lockdown, the dance is opening up to the economy. And we do this several times, but bear in mind that every time that you're locking down the economy, the economy requires significant effort to reestablish itself. Uh, one of my closest friends who happens to work for the Modi government in India was telling me that an estimate they did in India is that for every week of lockdown, the economy requires between four to six weeks to recover. So imagine a country that gets locked down for three months. It means that ahead of you, you got about two years before you can get the country back on its feet. So this is a problem that we see more and more as we do not understand the lockdown are only a mechanism to gain time to organize a response. They're not mechanism that you turn on and turn off depending on the number of, uh, of uh, instances you have, because otherwise, you're simply depleting the most important part during a pandemic, which is the public health system. Another important work from MIT was able to, to establish that in continuous lockdowns, what you tend to do by shrinking the economy, you shrink the capacity of the healthcare system to respond to crisis. So you actually, over time, make the healthcare response weaker. That's a scenario. It doesn't happen everywhere, but I think it has happened in some countries um, and we should be extremely careful that this is not becoming a chronic W. The technocracy triumph, what I was talking about, Asia becoming hard power and stepping into the leadership vacuum that the West has actually left, is really a U shape where we're looking at basically uh, a drop and then a rapid recovery, uh, although it will take some time because some Asian countries are supply side countries before their most economic value is established by trading with country with a higher per capita. This means that for a period of time, we can envision some form of uh, recession, but likely we'll see a recovery, especially in what happened recently with China leading the largest trade agreement in the history of the world, in which Asia will start mobilizing and coordinating their own resources. We have a frugal federalism, which is where we are gonna have a drop, then a long period of recession that will become depression, and only after a period of time, while new oligarchies will rise, a recovery. But the period of time in which we're gonna be in depression might be quite dangerous to eventually recover. And this is where government will need to heavily subsidize a number of different activities, but a government subsidy across the economy increases public debt over time. And finally, 
uh, Renaissance Reloaded. Some countries are currently recovering on a V shape. Uh, the United Arab Emirates, New Zealand, Australia, Taiwan, uh, Hong Kong, uh, somehow South Korea. These are countries that have gone through the crisis, but they were equally able to rise back up and they're now recovering by creating entirely different business models. And the loss they have incurred is not as harsh as the one we see, for example, in the United States, where we're looking at you know, one of the worst management of the crisis we have ever seen, um, or where we see in country in Europe that have struggled at first, they recover a little bit, they did not invest enough in the public health system, and they went into an even more severe second wave, uh, you know, exacerbated by the winter. So the future logic of what we imagine is something that looks a little bit like this. So why do I want to leave you a little bit before we go into the Q&A uh, with some hope? You know, this has been a really trying period of our history in which we really got completely off guard. And we started to have two problems. The first one is that we have made uh, this conversation very political. And so we have prevented some degree of international collaboration that would have really helped. And secondly, uh, we have really suffered of arrogance of the Western system in which individual liberties were considered to be more important than the collective benefit that we saw, for example, in, in country in which some degree of social obedience was actually more accepted. Uh, believing that I cannot reinforce a country to wear a mask is sort of like really an arrogance of the Western model in which we really think the individual liberties are above collective ones. And I think we should really think deeply about this, not because I challenge individual liberties, but because ahead of us, the number of system crises that we're gonna have at the global level will only increase. So unless we are able to create the right level of tension between individual liberties and collective needs, uh, we'll see another example similar to what happened with COVID-19 in which we see challenges becoming politicized, becoming political ideologies and costing at the end of the day, both life and economic opportunities. So that's where I think uh, it's one side of the conversation. The other side of the conversation is never we have seen so much collaboration and experimentation today is really a, a way of behaving, thinking and operating in many organization. We truly have accelerated rapidly. The fourth industrial revolution is closer now than it was before COVID. The chances to use technology to address some of the larger challenges we have globally using artificial intelligence to, for example, monitor the climate and creating scenarios, having the ability to use robotic to support when the economy are to some extent caught into an impasse, allowing the work from home to become a reality in which way more people will be able to create the degree of balance, recalibrating the difference between going to work and staying home. The social dynamics that we have discovered with family finding reunited by the ability to share and creating spaces that they've never seen before. Traffic having been reduced significantly in many cities. Now in many parts of the world, we do start appreciating what is actually a life without traffic. The rise of very frugal models, uh, more environmentally friendly, localization of uh, resources and some of the supply chain that has integrated global with local. I, personally think, as I have been studying COVID from a socioeconomic perspective, um, that while the shock has been a significant one, we should never discount it. If we're able to learn from what has happened, we'll find ourselves capable of really building a much more resilient 21st century. With organizations, they're gonna be much more capable of managing risk, much more flexible in understanding that systemic interdependency is inevitable. Uh, organization that will re reform their financing because they will now understand that having only two weeks of cash flow is a gamble that is too big to take. So I'm hoping that this will really reshape in the post-pandemic designs, a much more resilient society capable of addressing global challenges. Final comment, and then I think the time is great for some Q&A with you. You know, before the pandemic, the role of the multilateral organizations was really challenged. You know, the United States pulled out of the Paris Agreement, challenging NATO, challenging WHO, uh, criticizing the UN. 
it looked like the world was losing hope in this international institution. That I'm not saying they're perfect, but they were designed to address challenges that tend to be of a global nature. Today, COVID has created a global momentum for all of us to understand this. And while I think we have to profoundly reforms, reform the institution that were uh, originated from the 1944 conference in New Hampshire and 1948 uh, Mali uh, genesis of the UN, Today, they have to be reformed to understanding more of a global action network mindset in which more and more of multilateralism and plurilateralism will exist in the integration of local determinism. So if before we had the local economy and then we became a global society, today the ability to be locally deterministic but integrating the global economy by addressing an overarching nature of global challenges I think is an opportunity to reform the institutional framework that we have inherited after World War II. It became obsolete, as a matter of fact, and I think we can redesign those institutions for the kind of needs we have in the 21st century, which is very different from the kind of needs we had in 1948, when the world was trying to face an entirely different phase of its history. So this is where I like eventually to stop, because I guess I'm much more interested in the question and answer than in this. I only use few slides because I think that uh, what matters is just uh, the nature of the conversation. I'll stop my share and then I'm hoping that we can have uh, uh, some from Q&A with the participants and uh, I look forward to this. Okay, thank you very much. It was very interesting and very, and very enlightening. Uh, I um, I would like also to introduce my colleagues because I forgot completely to to intro introduce them. Very capable persons, Kamil Siko, who is a, a AI programmist, machine learning expert, and software designer, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. 